Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover the benefits and limitations of training to failure versus not training to failure. First, we need to define what exactly training to failure is. This is a very nuanced topic in itself, and there is disagreement between parties as to what this really means. So without going into too much detail, let's provide a working definition of failure specifically in the context of hypertrophy training. For this video, we will define failure as the inability to continue lifting with a strict and effective technique despite maximal intent. There are three important components in this definition which will be relevant for the rest of this video. One, failure is the actual failure of a repetition, meaning we physically cannot overcome the load being lifted. Second, this must occur despite maximal intent to continue lifting. So failure refers to ensuring maximal effort, not stopping the set when we feel like we may be close to failure. And third, this is all in the context of strict and effective technique. This means that the first rep should look exactly the same as the last rep of the set, it will just be slower. Although this is a fairly strict definition, we should also understand that the exact point of failure is subject to individual variation too. After all, we are humans, not robots, so factors such as pain tolerance, attitude, mood, stimulants, training experience and more may influence how failure looks for each trainee. Now that we understand what exactly failure is, let's now explore how training to failure compares with not training to failure on direct hypertrophy outcomes. Before exploring what the evidence says, we should mention one issue with this question. When we compare failure versus non-failure training, we don't know exactly what non-failure training means. This could mean anything from training 10 reps in reserve or training one rep in reserve. So this is something to keep in mind and something we will go into more detail about throughout the rest of this video. The best evidence we have on this topic is this meta-analysis which compared the evidence on training to failure versus not training to failure on hypertrophy outcomes. Overall, there was no significant difference in hypertrophy outcomes when training to failure or not to failure. However, there did appear to be a slight trend in favour of training to failure, although this was not considered significant. While this meta-analysis looked at the overall literature on the topic, there is still some more nuance to be explored. One major question that this analysis didn't answer is the effect of training to failure versus non-failure on a single versus multiple sets. I don't think anyone would argue that for a single set, training further from failure would be more hypertrophic than training to failure. Outcomes may be equivalent at best, but it seems logical that training to failure in a single set will be more hypertrophic than not training to failure in a single set. However, lifters aiming to maximize hypertrophy almost never perform a single set in a training session and leave. We usually perform multiple sets of each exercise, multiple exercises for the same muscle group, and train multiple muscles throughout the week. So we can't really compare failure versus non-failure training in a vacuum. We also need to consider it in the entire context of a training program. This interesting study explored the effects of leg press and leg extension training to failure versus non-failure on quad hypertrophy. Trainees performed multiple sets of leg presses and leg extensions twice per week for 10 weeks. One leg was trained by taking each set to failure, while they were instructed to train the other leg by stopping at the point before they reached failure, which ended up being around 1-2 to two reps in reserve on average. It was found that hypertrophy outcomes were similar between limbs, with the non-failure group actually achieving slightly superior growth. We can also see here that training to failure or not to failure both seem to result in near maximal muscle activation, probably explaining why both protocols resulted in similar muscle growth. These results may have been a result of acute fatigue. It may have been that when taking every set to complete failure, training quality could have diminished by the end of the workout. So the net hypertrophic response may actually be equal or slightly superior if we were to leave some reps in the tank on the initial sets of a session. So we now know that leaving a few reps in reserve probably seems to provide a very similar hypertrophy response compared with training to complete failure. So this now brings up the question, how close to failure should we train? How many reps in reserve should we leave in each set? Well, this is a whole topic in itself, so we won't go into too much detail. But basically, when loads are lighter, such as when we are working in the 15 to 20 rep range, we need to train closer to failure to ensure all motor units are recruited and trained. 
When we train with heavier loads, such as when we are working in the 6 to 10 rep range, we don't need to train as close to failure to achieve a significant hypertrophy stimulus, as motor unit recruitment will be maximized earlier in the set. This idea can be seen in this study, comparing failure versus non-failure training with different loads and rep ranges. Trainees performed leg extensions under four different conditions. One, training to failure with a heavier load. Two, training not to failure with a heavier load. Three, training to failure with a lighter load. And four, training not to failure with a lighter load. It was found that with the heavier loads, hypertrophy outcomes were similar between conditions where the sets were taken to failure or when a few reps were left in the tank. However, with lighter loads, training to failure was far superior compared with training not to failure. So far, we have only looked at the direct impact of training to failure on hypertrophy outcomes. However, our proximity to failure may also have indirect effects, which could potentially influence long-term muscle growth. Let's now cover what these are. First, let's explore the impact of proximity to failure on fatigue and recovery from training. To understand this, let's look at this study, which compared the effects of training to failure versus non-failure on fatigue and recovery of resistance training. Trainees performed the following three different training sessions at different points in time. First, trainees performed the squat and bench press for three sets of five with a 10RM load. Second, they performed six sets of five with a 10RM load. And third was three sets of 10 with zero reps in reserve. So all sets were taken basically to failure. It was found that training to failure took significantly longer to recover from, from both a physical and blood marker perspective compared with the other two groups training with reps in reserve. This was even the case despite one of the groups training with twice the number of sets as the failure group. This suggests that while hypertrophy seems to be similar when training to failure compared with stopping a few reps short of failure, fatigue and recovery is not similar. This is theorized to follow an exponential pattern. This means that each rep we train closer to failure, the amount of fatigue induced is greater than a one to one ratio. So the fatigue difference between leaving four to five reps in reserve is probably not that different, but the difference between one and zero reps in reserve is much more significant. So training to failure appears to significantly result in greater fatigue and extend recovery times, which may have an impact on other training variables. More specifically, proximity to failure may influence weekly volume. We know that volume has a significant impact on hypertrophy gains, where more volume tends to result in greater hypertrophy outcomes. Generally, we want to maximize how much volume we perform per week within our physical and practical limitations. However, how close we train to failure may impact our volume tolerance. Since training to failure seems to be much more fatiguing than leaving a few reps in reserve, if we train to failure too often, we may not be able to handle as much volume compared with training shy of failure. This means that although training to failure may be slightly more hypertrophic when comparing individual sets, this may inhibit the net hypertrophic stimulus by limiting our total weekly volume. So the overall stimulus throughout the week may actually be superior by limiting how often we train to failure. And lastly, training to failure may have an impact on effort and motivation in the gym. Anecdotally, it is difficult to maintain a high level of effort and concentration when training to true failure too frequently. If we take all sets to true failure, it is very difficult to maintain this level of effort for a single session, let alone an entire week, mesocycle or training career. Training to true failure on every set is a very difficult intensity to maintain, whereas stopping even one to two reps in reserve is much more sustainable. So far, it seems that training to failure is probably not the most efficient way to train from a stimulus versus fatigue trade-off. However, can training to true failure have some potential benefits over leaving reps in reserve in certain contexts? There are two primary benefits I can think of which provide a good rationale in support of training to failure. The first benefit is to help trainees learn exactly where the point of failure is. If we never train to failure, how do we know how far from failure we are? If we base our training program off reps in reserve or RPE, then it is probably important to actually know how far we can push ourselves so that we have a better understanding of sub-maximal effort too. While experienced lifters have probably failed enough reps in their life to have a more accurate determination of proximity to failure, newer lifters may not. So especially for newer lifters, 
it is probably important to train to failure every so often to become familiar with the feeling of true muscular failure. However, this should only be done on movements that are safe to do so, like isolation lifts, machine exercises, and cable movements. And the other benefit of training to failure is for those who follow a relatively low volume training routine. Although volume seems to be a primary driver of hypertrophy, some people aren't able to train with high volumes due to either physical or practical limitations. In such a case, it may actually be beneficial to train to failure more frequently as it is likely to provide a slightly superior stimulus per set. If you only have a few sets training a single muscle group in a single session, then it is probably going to be beneficial to take each of these sets closer to failure. So to summarize this video, let's establish some practical recommendations. As a general rule, the following proximity to failure ranges are recommended. When training in the six to 10 rep range, sets should be taken around two to three reps in reserve on average. When training in the 10 to 15 rep range, sets should be taken around one to two reps in reserve on average. And when training in the 15 to 20 plus rep range, sets should be taken closer to failure around zero to one reps in reserve. The other question to answer is, should we ever actually train to true failure for hypertrophy training? Well, it is certainly not mandatory to do so, but some training to failure may have benefits for some people. As a general rule, the following recommendations are proposed for training to failure. Training to failure should be fairly infrequent in a training program on average. This frequency may be slightly higher for those training with a lower overall training volume and less frequent for those training with a higher weekly volume. Training to failure is only really appropriate in exercises which are safe and which ensure the muscle is the limiting factor. This is usually reserved for isolation lifts, machines, and cable movements. And lastly, training to failure is most appropriate in the last few sets training a muscle group in that session, rather than training to failure in sets at the beginning of the session. Lifters can use this information to make informed decisions, to decide how close to failure they want to train and how frequently they want to train to true failure. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.